Union address on television, right? And President Bush came up on the screen and said, before I begin, I'd like to say a special hello to my good friend Roy Showman out there. You know, I faint in my chair. And this was a million billion times greater than that. I mean, this is the God who created the universe, the God who created existence itself, who was watching over me and loving me and, and, and caring about me every moment of my existence. So I, I was, um, uh, let me not leave this experience for a moment, but I was obviously able to be happy in a way that I had never been happy since, since childhood. I prayed to know his name so I would know what religion to follow. I couldn't put this together with the God of the Old Testament. I know it was the God of the Old Testament, but if you read the Old Testament, the, uh, the, the face of God that's revealed, to, especially to the Jews, frankly, is, is far more distant and, and judgmental and mostly distant because he, when he spoke to man in the days of the Old Testament, he spoke through the prophets, right? He spoke through Moses. He spoke through Jeremiah. But he didn't speak to the hoi polloi. And in fact, uh, before he was going to uh, reveal himself face to face to Moses on the top of Mount Sinai, he told Moses, build a fence around the base of the mountain and keep any of the people from touching the base of the mountain because should they even touch the base of the mountain while I'm on top, I'll have to kill them you know, because I'm so holy and it will be, it will be sacrilege. And that was my sense of, of God. So I couldn't put this together with Judaism, but I knew I wanted nothing other than to worship and serve this God. So I prayed on the spot, let me know your name so I know what religion to follow. I don't mind if you're Buddha and I have to become a Buddhist. I don't mind if you're Apollo and I have to become a Roman pagan. I don't mind if you're Christian and I have to become Hindu, as long as you're not Christ and I have to become Christian. <laughs> so he respected this prayer. And of course, I was praying this prayer because I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to hear that at that point. So I went back to Cambridge, where I was uh, living, still living the life of a professor and consultant, and, but happy for the first time since childhood, because I knew, I mean, I knew there was no reason to be worried about anything. I knew that we lived forever. You know, I knew that, uh, you know, everything was arranged for our, our best good, and life had an infinite meaning, and so forth. And it was very hard for me to pay attention, by the way, to marketing at Harvard Business School after this experience. I no longer do it, by the way. But so I was absolutely, I mean, from one day to the next, right? Obviously, the, the, I don't want to say the meaning of my life changed. It's like in the presence of the real meaning of life, you know, of course, everything else falls away. So um, all I really wanted to do was pursue this experience and know who this God was and know what religion to follow. So what do I do? Well, I had just had a mystical experience, right? And this was, um, I figured, you know, what do you do to find out more about a mystical experience? You go find a mystic to talk to which wasn't a very prudent thing to do in Cambridge in the 1980s. <laughs> so um, I looked up this, uh, this, this, this man about my age who I actually worked as a temp typist in, in one of the consulting firms that I had been at, who I knew was a self-styled mystic. He was a fallen away Catholic, by the way. And I called him up and I said, you know, is, is your interest in mysticism just academic or do you really have some experiential knowledge? And he said, oh, no, 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 it's very experiential. So I made an appointment. I went over to visit him in his apartment one evening to find out more about this experience and what it meant and who this God was. Well, um, he put me on all kinds of really bad paths, right, because he was uh, basically into occultism, into this you know, Hindu meditation, into you know, every you know, crazy thing springing from the New Age. And he filled my arms with all of these terrible books and everything. And so he did all of these terrible things. But one really good thing happened while I was at his apartment which was he had a book on his coffee table, uh, like a coffee table book, one of these big picture books, which was called something like The Hundred Greatest Miracles of Modern Times. And uh, when this man, his name was Bob, went into the kitchen to make us some tea, I just leafed through this book on the coffee table. And my eyes fell on a page devoted to the miracle at Fatima, right? It's the first time I had heard of the miracle at Fatima. It's the first time I had heard of Fatima. So I'm reading about Fatima and how the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to these children and how the sun spun in the sky and crashed to earth and was seen by 80,000, 100,000 people. And Bob comes back from the kitchen, and, I, and I'm, I'm stunned, right? And I point to this page, and I say, I is this really true? Did this really happen? And he says, oh, yes. And I say, well, well, has anyone else ever heard of it? Because here, I had gone all my life, right? I had probably spent about 25 years in school, uh, you know, had 
you know, degrees coming out of my ears, and no one had ever told me about the miracle at Fatima or the apparitions at Fatima. So let me start on digression number two, which is uh, miracles are a really good way to evangelize. And of course, this is a Medjugorje conference, so it's kind of appropriate. But, um, you know, we live in this pseudoscientific age. Everybody wants objective evidence. Everybody wants a reason to, you know, believe or to not believe. And we have those reasons in miracles. We shouldn't be, I'm not blaming anyone. I shouldn't be saying we shouldn't be keeping it secret. And, of course, you here, I'm kind of preaching to the choir. But, um, you know, all Catholics should talk about the miracles. I mean, it's a wonderful way to evangelize. And... Um, you know, I've, I mean, I was filled in this experience when I was over at Bob's house. My initial reaction was furious indignation. Here, all my life, I had been in agony over why in the days of the Old Testament did God used to perform miracles and he no longer performs miracles? Why did he used to talk to people and he no longer talks to people? And this was my constant complaint. You know, in Hebrew school, I would always ask the teachers, and they would have no answer, and I would go away dejected. And here was the answer. He didn't stop, right? He's still doing it. It's just that... No, no one had told me about it. So anyway, I left there furious that no one had told me about Fatima. But with this idea of Fatima in the back of my mind, I spent that year, I better speed up actually. I hope that doesn't mean talking even faster. I apologize, but I am a New York Jew, right? Um, <laughs> but um, uh, I, I went away with these books which were leading me on all these bad paths and I wasted most of a year you know, pursuing them but with the idea of Fatima in the back of my head. And every night before going to sleep, I would say a short prayer of my own invention to know the name of my Lord and Master who had revealed himself to me that day on the beach. And a year after the initial experience, I went to sleep. I felt as though I were woken by a hand gently rocking my shoulder. Now, I know technically I was asleep. I know that if there was a camera in the room, it would have shown me asleep in bed. But I can only describe it the way I experienced it and the way my memory represents it to me, which is that I was woken by a hand on my shoulder, led to a room, and left alone with the most beautiful young woman I could ever imagine. Just to be in her presence, just to be in the presence of the purity and the intensity of the love that flowed from her, was to be in a state of ecstasy greater than I imagined could exist. And I knew without being told that it was the Blessed Virgin Mary, um, all I wanted to do was throw myself on my knees and honor her somehow. I'll tell the truth. All I really wanted to do was throw myself on my knees and, and worship her. And in my own defense, I'll say that if you read either the Old Testament or the New Testament, whenever anyone found themselves face to face with an angel, right, like St. John in the, um, in the Apocalypse, um, their initial reaction was to throw themselves prostrate and begin to worship the angel until the angel says, no, 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 get up. That's not appropriate. I'm only a creature like you. And we know that the Blessed Virgin Mary is the queen of angels, that she's more glorious and more exalted than the most exalted of angels. So if that is the natural human response in the presence of an angel, how much more so is it the natural human response in the presence of the queen of angels? So... I found myself in her presence. All I wanted to do was somehow honor her appropriately. One of the first thoughts that crossed my mind was, oh my goodness, I wish I at least knew the Hail Mary. <laughs> but I didn't. So um, uh, the, the first thing she said to me was that she would answer any questions that I might have for her. So in fact, the first question I asked her came out of this desire to honor her appropriately somehow. I think I really wanted to say, would you teach me the Hail Mary? But I was too proud to admit that I didn't know it. So instead, I said, uh, what's your favorite prayer to you? As a kind of backdoor way. And uh, her initial response was a little bit um, uh, coy. Her initial response was, I love all prayers to me. But I was a little bit pushy. Maybe that has to do with being a New York Jew and maybe not. <laughs> but I said, uh, but come on, you must love some prayers to you more than others. And she relented, and she recited a prayer, but it was in Portuguese, and I didn't know any Portuguese. <laughs> so all I could do was make the effort to remember phonetically the first few syllables, and as soon as I woke up the next morning, I wrote down those first few words phonetically. And later, when I met a Portuguese Catholic woman, I asked her to recite all the Portuguese prayers to Mary.